down? Sure. Jim, try it again. Do you like how I just added more time to our thing? Just miraculous. Oh, you need more time. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I guess I'm not going to the bathroom. You heard me talking? Hey, Jim. They do hear me on there. I'm going to have to turn my mic off. Good morning, sir. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Geneva Presbyterian Church. If you're joining us online and got kicked off, uh, hopefully you can join us back again. Wait a second. If you're hearing me, you're already on. I'm being funny. Um, so we are learning uh, all sorts of things about technology. It turns out that even though we mute me, uh, my microphone on the, the soundboard, you're hearing me online all the time. So if you folks online that have been watching online and you hear the pastor's mic on all the time, we're going to handle it different today. Hopefully that doesn't uh, interrupt us again. Uh, today is uh, Pentecost Sunday. This is, Pentecost is a very old tradition. It's not just Christian. This goes back uh, into Jewish history and we're going to talk about that today. But it's a day of significance for us because this is the day the Holy Spirit comes and indwelled uh, in the, uh, the disciples for the first time. And it changed the world. And the Holy Spirit's indwelling in us continues to change us today. So as we gather, that's the encounter we're looking for. May the Holy Spirit fall upon us. Lifting us up, making us new. Now, if in the middle of service I see a, li uh, a lake of flame over your head, I'm calling you up, just so you know. And it's going to be your service at that point. So, Bob, get ready. <laughs> but we do hope to have some encounter, some changing events, where we walk out today different, closer to God than when we walked in. Let us begin today by opening our hearts and our minds to God's presence in prayer. Let us pray. God, today we come and for a little bit of our week, we come and bow before your throne. We come to sing our praise to you, giving thanks for your love and for who you are. We come for an encounter with your Holy Spirit that would be changing, life-giving, that we would be sent out, made new in you, visibly changed. We come to lift up our prayers our hopes, our concerns, our fears, knowing you're here, that you hear us, and that you respond. We come to hear your word, to learn more about your love, the ways you interact with your creation and your call upon our lives. And all of this, God, we do with hope and expectation and with gratitude and praise. In Jesus' name, we leave this prayer to you. And through the power of your indwelling, ever living within us, Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, our worship leader is Debbie. And Debbie Shuffler, we're glad to have you with us today. I wish you could see what I'm seeing because it's so great to see all that red up there. Everybody's 
everybody follow directions. Very well. Welcome to worship at the New Presbyterian Church. Especially those of you who are with us for the first time. If you have a prayer request, please use a yellow prayer card and pass it to the usher during our opening hymn. If you are joining us online, feel free to share your prayer request in the comments section below. If you are a first-time guest and you are moved to join us next week, hit the like button to be notified when we go live with our service. We are extremely glad that you're here. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. For those of you who are able, please stand. Hear now our call to worship. Wild and free, created and refreshing, Come, Holy Spirit. Gentle and mysterious, patient and caring, God's Spirit moves in our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. Breaking barriers and making connections, healing divisions and making us one, God's Spirit flows between us. Come, Holy Spirit. We will begin with our opening hymn on the screen or 442 in your hymnal, The Church is One Foundation. <laughs> That's okay. So you're just hearing me. Often fail. We encounter roadblocks in our everyday lives and we sin. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins first privately, then publicly. Lord.
Let us pray. God of fire and wind, holy and powerful, mighty and mysterious, we are drawn by your spirit to this place. As we gather and behold your glory, we become aware of our sin. We have ignored your word. We have rejected your gifts. We have failed in your work. Ignoring the truth of the Pentecost, we exclude those different from us. We divide our loyalties and we divide our hearts. Let your spirit burn away our sins and fill us with faith and courage so that we might live into the promise of this day and receive the fullness of all that you have prepared for us in Jesus Christ. Hear now our assurance of pardon. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. These words assure us that God will never leave us and he has already forgiven us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world with Am I not on? Yeah, I am. Okay. Well, I, I think we're figuring out the soundboard. What happened? Some buttons got uh, pushed and switched. So hopefully uh, those are, who are online are getting more than just my microphone at this point. Um, we will be checking this later in the week and making sure that works properly. So when we come together, we always want to take our time to uh, take a time to lift up our prayers. We lift them up individually, knowing that God does hear and answer each of these prayers. And each prayer, after each prayer, we always uh, give it to the Lord by, uh, through our response, saying, Lord, hear our prayers. This morning, Judy is, uh, has a prayer. Uh, she has a prayer of blessing that Peggy Krillin is the 2022 PW Woman of the Year. We, we're going to be talking... Okay, very good. And... Uh, Judy, we had scheduled our stewardship moments was going to be for PWs. Are you making that announcement? Were you aware of that? No, I wasn't. So, it's now being so, so now you are aware. Are you ready, or do you want me to do that? If you want, or I could. Very good. All right. <laughs> so we give thanks. The PWs recognize that there are so many people in our congregation who do serve, who volunteer, give themselves freely. And we give thanks to God for everybody who is able and does give that uh, of their time. And so we lift up our thanks to God as we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Kay is praying for safe travels for Laura and her uh, grandson's family as they go home to Arizona today. May God bless them and keep them safe. We lift that to God as we say, Lord, hear our prayers. And may he guard their uh, gas tank. Jack today has a prayer for a son who's going through uh, um, marriage, uh, difficult, I'm guessing a tough marriage time. And so we pray for him and pray for his uh, family and his spouse. We pray for um, healing in their relationship. And we lift that to God as we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Phyllis today has a, uh, a prayer, a couple of prayers. First, a big joy that Peggy Corral is Woman of the Year, which we just said. She has a praise for her girlfriend, Sherry, in uh, Walla Walla. She uh, had a uh, right hip surgery and is in recovery. So we are glad that the things went well for Sherry. May her recovery continue to go well. And we lift up our prayers to God as we say, Lord, hear our prayers. I'm sorry, Jack. Okay. Uh, Doris has a prayer for safe flights for her son Anthony today and next week. So we pray for safe travels and uh, traveling mercies. And we lift them to God as we say, 
Lord, hear our prayers. Carol has a prayer for uh, Amber Cooper. She is having a biopsy tomorrow. So we pray for good results, uh, and we lift that prayer to God in hope, saying, Lord, hear our prayers. She also has a prayer for um, America and our world to stop the violence, um, violence of, of, of innocent, uh, innocent folks. So we pray for, uh, for a cessation of all the violence that we are seeing in America and in the world. We lift that prayer to God as we say, Lord, hear our prayers. And then Perry has a prayer for uh, Alexis and Dustin uh, who are in Ohio for 30 days. Dustin uh, was uh, in an auto accident and broke uh, and sprained his ankle. This just happened. Yeah. Holy cow. So we pray for him. He's in the hospital in Ohio. Uh, how's he doing? He's waiting for surgery on the ankle. So has to have surgery on the ankle. So we lift up Alexis and Dustin. We pray for Dustin's healing. We pray for a quick surgery and a quick recovery, and we pray for their peace as we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Are there any other prayer requests that uh, we didn't get a chance to write down that you would like to lift up right now? Then let us go before God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, as we come before your throne, we do so in hope and expectation. We lift to you, God, those prayers that we can share out loud, those prayers that we want others to hear and to know about. But there are so many, God, that we don't want to say out loud, that we hold close to our heart. So now, God, in a moment of silence and in hope that you hear that as well, we come before you and lift up those prayers we hold close to our heart. Gracious God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for inviting us before your throne, telling us to come, making our prayers known to you, and then telling us that you do hear and answer our prayers. It's not always easy, God, to come before your throne. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we're afraid to come before you, but we pray that you would help us to continue in faith and hope to come and lift up our prayers. Lord, we are inherently a very impatient people. We need your help to wait for your perfect timing. And lastly, God, we pray for a strength to accept the answers that you give us, knowing that your answers are not always what we pray for. We pray for the, the, the strength to accept those answers and to know that your answers are always right. For this, God, we lift up our thanks and our praise to you now and forevermore. Amen. Okay. Um, normally, we at this point, we do our Lord's Prayer. And as I said, we're going to be switching up. This week, we are going to do our Nicene Creed. The words are on the screen. The words are in your bulletin. So let us come together and say what it is that we profess and we believe in. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one in being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sakes, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance to the scriptures he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and from the Son, with whom the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that Nicene Creed is helpful. That is one of the oldest creeds we hold to. That and the Apostles' Creed, which is very similar, from which the Nicene Creed was built and based upon, holds for us the foundational beliefs of Christians worldwide, despite our differences. And it helps us to know who and what we are. That could be for us a whole sermon series. And maybe one day we'll take a look at doing that and breaking into it and looking at it a little bit more. All right. As we move into our stewardship moment, stewardship for us, remember, is, is the, the tending to and caring of the gifts that we've been given by God. Our volunteers use those gifts on a regular basis. Those people who come and volunteer their time, and they're not necessarily here at our church. We have people who volunteer in town. We have people who volunteer with other people. But we have some folks here that, that work tirelessly to continue to help the church do the work that we are called to. Every year the PWs come together and they find the person that has been working uh, diligently to, to do the work of the church. And what I found out, something I did not know before until I, I was at the PW luncheon this week, is that uh, the PWs recognize not only women in the church, you know that they can sometimes recognize men, so by the way, so men, if you ever want to be a PW person of the year, uh, it, it, make sure you do a lot of volunteer work, and we'll make sure that the PWs are paying attention to you as well. You never know. But the, somebody who has tirelessly worked in our church for years and years has been Peggy Krillin. And this year they recognized her, her volunteerism, her service and unselfish dedication and so for that, we are all very proud and glad for that work. And we say thank you to Peggy Krellen for all that you do and all that you've been for so long. Amen. Amen. As a lifetime member of the PW Women of the Year, she will always have her pin. So if you ever see her without her pin, say, hey, we're, no, I'm kidding. But she has that pin. She's in a, in a lot of our PWs, a lot of our uh, women of the year. You'll see them wear that pin. Ask her. She'll tell you all about it. Now, stewardship, again, is not just our service. It's not just our time with God. It is also those spiritual disciplines that we practice that help us to develop the characters that God wants us and wants in us. So we give thanks to God for that. We give thanks to God for how he takes care of us. If you'll stand in body or spirit... We'll come together and we'll sing our doxology in thanks to God for that gift. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So uh, Debbie just reminded me there is something going on today that we want to be mindful of. We have some folks who aren't with us today because they're up in Manteca. Manteca had gotten to a point where it's time for them to close their doors. And so we are, uh, it's with heavy hearts that we recognize that was necessary for them. We're thankful for the service that they have had in their community and we pray for their members as they look at where they're going next to serve. So for, let's take a moment and lift them up in prayer as well. 
God, we thank you for what you've done through Manteca and through the people of that congregation. They are the church of Manteca Presbyterian Church, and they continue to do your work despite the closing of their building and closing of that congregation. We pray for your blessing upon them, for a peace that would surpass all understanding today, and a celebration of who they've been. In Jesus' name, amen. Somehow, every time Debbie Scheffler comes in to be the worship leader, without our intention of doing so, she gets the best of all scriptures. The one with the hardest names, the longest long passages. She called me to, uh, this week and said, how did you do this to me again? I was like, wait a minute, you're the worship leader this week? Yeah. Today, as you're, as you're hearing the scriptures, I want to I want to pull out something I want you to be paying attention to. I want you to be hearing what it is that happened. Not, not the, the Spirit's indwelling, that's important, but who did the Spirit indwell? Who did the Spirit turn to and use? And what was their reception by the people around them? How were they received? Debbie, I'll yeah. turn to you to read. He said this not on purpose, I have a hard time believing. Hymn. There's a Sorry. hymn. You're saved. I'm sorry. We'll we'll I'm sing saved. next. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite hymn, and that's why it saved me. There you go. I'm the Lord of sea and sky. I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it of stone, give them hearts for love alone, I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send, here I am, Lord, is it people 
Okay, here we go. I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations that I will make, but I really think that Pastor Josh and Pastor Steve and Pastor Bonnie are the only ones who are going to know I'm making a mistake, so it's okay. Our scripture reading today is from Acts 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, it will be God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above, and signs on earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And here she was worried she would mess up the easy words. She did great. What do you think? Anybody offended yet? Is anybody offended yet? Then give me a minute. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not trying to offend, but I, I would assume that if you were offended, you probably wouldn't say so. Um. Sometimes there are things that, uh, that we engage in that, that prick us a little bit, that cause us to get a little bristled. And I want to just kind of go over some of these difficult things. Bigotry is a word that we all kind of, or at least I react to. When I hear that word, my ears immediately perk up. Truth is, I'm... I'm a little afraid of hearing that word, somebody coming to me and talking about our church or our ministry or me and using that word to describe us in any way, I'm, my ears perk up and I would want to make sure that that's never the case. But as I was reading the scriptures this week and, and as I had planned out this uh, service, I was, it occurred to me we're addressing bigotry in this passage. And I thought, well, you know, maybe we start with not going over the passage but defining bigotry. So do I have anybody who would like to, to volunteer a little bit today? Do a little reading? I'll come back to you. So bigotry is a noun. This is the Webster 
definition. You're going to have to lean over a little bit because I can't, my, I won't reach that far. All right, read that bigotry definition. Obstinate. Obstinate, internet, devotion to one's own opinion and project the state of the mind of, of a bigotry. Exactly. So obstinate or intolerant devotion to one's own opinion and prejudices, the state of mind of a bigot, it's also defined as acts or beliefs, characteristics of a bigot. Now, y'all know me, and uh, I have an issue with you defining a word with the word. You know, that's, that's, most of us teachers have that issue, right? So the question then is, well, let's define bigot. A person who is obstinately or intolerantly devoted to his or her own opinions and prejudices, especially when regarding or treats the members of a group such as a racial or ethnic group with hatred and intolerance. Bigotry is a pejorative word. It is a word that we do react to. It's a word that most of us do not want associated with who we are. Today we're going to look into how bigotry affected the people who were around the disciples as they heard God as they saw the manifestation of God's Spirit being lived out. And we're going to wonder, where does that reside today? And the trouble is, we're going to find, is that all too often we flirt with bigotry without ever meaning to. And we're going to try to pull that out today. Let us take a moment, though, and begin with prayer. God, as we open your word, we celebrate today this indwelling of your spirit as it came down from heaven and filled your people. Today we live in that new world where your spirit lives in our hearts and changes our lives. So today we pray that that spirit would illuminate our heart and minds to your word, to your lessons, to your teachings. Help us to see ourselves more clearly in new ways and to be willing to engage and change those things which do not conform to who you would have us be. I pray this through the power of your Spirit, and then in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As I said at the beginning of service, Pentecost is an old uh, celebration. It didn't start with Christians. It actually started as a Jewish tradition. It was one of the three big Jewish holidays, the three um, uh, pilgrimage festivals where, the, where people would come and go to Jerusalem and all of Israel, all of that area. Jerusalem was the high point. You'd go up to Jerusalem or you'd come down from Jerusalem. It wouldn't be you go uh, up north and down south or you would, for them, you'd, you'd be going up south or down north. If there was a peak, and there are peaks that are higher, you'd be going up to Jerusalem, no matter if that peak were higher, because for Jerusalem, its height was based upon where God resides. It was the highest point of their religious and theological and incarnational world, where God came and lived. This is the festival of weeks, seven weeks after Passover, celebrating the harvest, the giving of the first fruits, the, the worship and the praising of God for what they were given. Shavuot. This again comes after Passover, one of the other big uh, pilgrimage festivals where people came into Jerusalem. And the last one was later in the year, Sukkot, or the, the festival of booths or tents. Pentecost, meaning 50 in Greek, is celebrated roughly 50 days after the first day of Passover. So Jerusalem is full of people from all over. People from all over Judea. And remember at this point, Israel is no longer this big all 12 tribes. They've had division. They've seen war decimate their, their, their tribes. Judah are the, the two tribes of the south plus the Levites that still reside. People would come from all over, from far away, and come to Jerusalem. And we see that today and all those great names that Debbie went through. She loves that. Don't you believe it for a second she doesn't. 
And so you had a town full of people that didn't all speak the same language. They didn't speak the same way. Then the Holy Spirit came and changed everything. Now, to this point, well, to, to the point where Jesus was where Jesus died on the cross, the Holy Spirit came to the people in Jerusalem only to the Holy of Holies. You had this big temple complex, and then in the temple you had the temple building in which you had the outer sanctum and the Holy of Holies. And, and everybody can come into the, into the temple area, but then to the temple itself, only the priestly group can, be, can go into that. The Holy of Holies, you didn't go in. It was cordoned off, big tapestry that way up there that, that separated the Holy of Holies and the seat of God from the rest of the temple. And on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they would come in and they would offer the sacrifice of blood for the, for the remission of sins for the people. Now, I, in, in, in college, I had a professor that liked to teach about uh, the priests and what they did, and he said that the priest would wear a robe that had bells attached to it. And I said, well, why is that? Well, what happens if you see the face of God? You die. And, and, and where does God reside? In the Holy of Holies. And what happens if you're in the Holy of Holies and you look up and you see the face of God? You die. I said, well, that's interesting. He said, yes, and they used to tie a rope to his ankle, and if the bell stopped, they'd pull him out. <laughs> so I did some research at one point. Now, that's a, that's, a, that's a, a legend, and it's just that. There's nothing in the scriptures that substantiate nothing in the Talmud or any of the other writings uh, of that time. It's something that we start to see coming around, I think, the 13th century. It's either the 3rd or the 13th century. They're so close together. Uh, and uh, it, was a, it was a legend. You got it. Everybody else is like, what do you mean? And, but it was, it was uh, the area where only one person would go in. And, and it was so sacred and reverent. And you remember that when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to that tapestry that divided the Holy of Holies from the other part of the temple? It rent in two, top to bottom. Opening the Holy Spirit now, there is no place for the Holy Spirit to come. And here we are on Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit comes and, and dwells upon the disciples. Revealing a change in God's interaction with all of creation and God's people. And this brings us to the crux of our issue here today. Who is it that God should appear to? Who is it that should come and be ready for God's coming, I mean, and be able to, to, to receive God? And the answer is God's people, of course, specifically the priests. That's the way it's always been. Why would it be any different? And the Holy Spirit comes and turns the apple cart over and changes everything. Now, the high priests, the priestly clan, they... they think high of, of, of their relationship with God, and not for, for no reason, for, but for good reason. Take passages like Isaiah 43. Now thus says the Lord, He has created you, O Jacob. He has formed you, O Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not burn, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba as exchange, in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight, and I honor and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. This is God talking to God's people. Of course they have this idea that they are select, they are separated, they are holy, they are devout, they are the ones God loves. There's no way God's going to come to anybody else but them. So how did they respond when those Galatians came? 
those people that were half Jewish, not even full blood, those people who were other. How did they respond? Well, not very well, did they? You see, God failed to follow their rules. Their rules that said God has a way of interacting, their rules that said that they, God was going to come to them, God chose some other way to interact with God's creation. Their reactions, as we see, were amazement and astonishment. And they asked each other, are these not, are these, are not these that are speaking Galatians? Amazed and astonished, incredulous, angry even. Are not all of these who are speaking Galatian, these half-breeds from up north, these half-Jews, Bigot said, what? Surely God would never use anybody so unworthy. Yet the evidence is hard to refute, but not impossible. And now, and how is it that we hear, each of us in our own language, Corinthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phygeria, uh, Palampha, uh, Egypt, other parts of Liberia belonging to Cyrene, the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs, all in our own language. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power, and all were amazed and perplexed and asked one another, what does this mean? Finally, an intellectual bigot. You know how you can tell somebody's intellectual, right? Balaam had a donkey. And the donkey didn't want to go where Balaam was sending him, and the donkey stopped because the donkey saw the angel of God, and Balaam smacked the donkey, and the donkey, being the intellectual that the donkey was, said, What? Why are you hitting me? The intellectual asks questions. That was one smart ass. If you didn't get the joke the first time, I have to kind of spill it out a little bit. These, these, these men are sitting there going, what does this mean? They were asking questions, which is, which is really profound, which is great. They need to ask that question. What does this mean? Again, the people who have been taught that they were favored by God over all people, the leaders entrusted by God to represent God to the people, clearly they looked foolish now because it wasn't them that the Spirit was coming to. And they said, aren't those people from Galilee? Surely this isn't, this can't be. So they came up with this idea. They had this thought to explain this away, to make this less of a thing. They said, oh, they're filled with new wine. Think about that for a second. We hear them in our own language because they're drunk. Now, I don't know about you, but the last time I was around a drunk person, I didn't hear any of the language I got. They're drunk. Yes, drunk men miraculously were able to speak the language and the dialect of everybody there. What's the name of a quadruped that we throw a saddle on, we guide it with a uh, bit and reins, and we use it for sport and work? What do we call that quadruped? And, and it's spelt a very specific way in the English language. But if you're in Texas, it's not a horse, it's a horse. You have to add that extra syllable in. Hey, uh, Irwin, what do you call a horse in Boston? A hoss. Right? You drive a car? You ride a hoss? I had a friend growing up who was from Boston and came down, and it took me about a week to understand what they were saying to me. We spoke the same language, and we didn't understand each other very well. I said, y'all, and he said, what? I said, fixing to, he said, what? 
He said, caught. And I said, what? These drunk men were somehow able to talk so that everybody heard in their own language. And even if they spoke the same language, their dialects were different. And they spoke in their own dialect. The people from Boston heard them in their own dialect. The people from, from Texas heard them in their own dialect. The people from Crete, the people from Libya, the people from Mesopotamia, all over heard them in their own language and in their own dialect. And somehow this is not, not a big deal because they were just drunk. What a miracle unto itself. A miracle. They tried to explain away God's interaction with their people by saying they were drunk, failing to understand that that itself was the bigger miracle. It's far easier to believe that God was at work here rather than new wine. But that was their retort. That was their explanation. That was how they tried to make sense of this very thing. And it, they liked that idea because choosing wine didn't hurt their pride as much. It didn't count them as unworthy in some way. No longer was God a part of this, so therefore they weren't to blame. How often in our lives do we seek to, 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 to do away with blame and we put ourselves in all sorts of contorted twists, becoming a human pretzel just so that we don't have to take blame. This isn't God. It's not our fault. We didn't do anything wrong. We're still worthy. This is them being drunk. Peter rebuts them and rebukes them. It's not wine, he says, but fulfillment of the Scriptures. Now, the religious leaders had a line that they had to hold. They had to defend their positions as men, called out for a special purpose. A special purpose that, w that ordinary men could not and should not fill. They were separate. They were not only God's people, they were the really important people of God's people in, in, in communicating, with connecting with God. You and I two have been called out, ordained for a special purpose. We as Christians have been touched, have been blessed, and some of us have been ordained into special ministries. We hold special offices, purpose to be that interaction between God and God's people, to be prophetic. Being prophetic mean, does not mean that I tell you what the future holds. Being prophetic means that we are called to, to share how God sees his world right now. Do we, in our special purpose-driven lives, do we ever exclude anybody? Do we ever place upon others requirements? Now, we're good Presbyterians. Of course we don't, right? We are the most welcoming and accepting of all denominations, are we not? Can I get an amen? amen. That didn't feel good, I've got to tell you. <laughs> You'll never have me being one of those preachers. Do we ever require an adherence to a ritual or a practice? Hmm. Do we ever require little things or large things do we ever require people to wear certain things to church? What a day to say that, right? Everybody's wearing red today. That was, this was, it wasn't a requirement, it was an invitation, but there are, we do require clothes. But back east, there wasn't a day I went into the office where I wasn't in at least a sports coat and always a tie. When I got here, I was asked to tone it down a little bit. I don't wear ties anymore. And i got to tell you, it's a little strange being up here and not wearing ties. There's, there, there are days I'm going, I really should wear a tie, and I'm, there's reasons I don't now. So we don't have strict adherence, but hopefully we don't look at somebody in clothes and say, hmm, that doesn't look proper here. It does happen in places. Hopefully we aren't doing that. Do we ever require people to follow certain practices 
like marking your food in the refrigerator or the cabinets, what you're allowed to clean out or clear out of those spaces. Do we ever require that there are certain groups that you're supposed to be a part of and participate in? There's a certain curriculum you're to use. There's an age that you have to be to be a leader. Where is it that we set exclusionary boundaries in our own church life here in our own little corner of the world? It's easy to look out and see what other people are doing and what, how they're not doing it right. The question is, if we turn that microscope onto us, that magnifying glass into our lives, are we at all guilty of creating boundaries where we say there are others and in order to fit in you have to conform that there are things that we hold as our place, our responsibility, ours. Sadly, we too have our own holy of holies that we fiercely protect and guard. And what happens when God comes in and doesn't obey our rules? What happens when the minister shines a light on our dirty little secrets? What happens when somebody steps up and says, this is how I'm called to serve and to work, and it doesn't fit within our understanding of how we do things. It doesn't fit within the book of order. It doesn't fit within our church's guidelines. Do we just accept them and welcome their leadership and service, or do we exclude and condemn they're not like us. They're not following our norms and our traditions and our rules. They fail to understand the value and importance of what we do. Just occurs to me what kind of danger I'm in preaching this because this is online. And if the denomination gets a hold of this, I could be in trouble. I'm not advocating for anarchy, but I do want to point out that we too hold a sacred line that says, this is required, this is how we act, this is how God interacts with us, and this is how we interact with God and each other. Honestly, our best intentions do and continue to get us into trouble. It is not that the men of old and, the, and that, that were responding to the disciples were necessarily bad men that were angry, that, 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 were, that were somehow malicious, they were people who took their positions very seriously. Their position of helping people connect to God. Good men that didn't understand how God would work outside of the paradigm that they had come to understand and live within. We too struggle whenever God works outside of our paradigm. We are reformed. We have been reformed and we continue to be reformed. And it's never simple, it's never easy, it's always difficult and almost always painful whenever God brings change into our lives. We never set out to be exclusionary. We never set out to set people out as different. We think we don't do that, but in, unintentionally, we'll set that up and we'll do that. Some of our very simplest practices sometimes say, you're not part of who we are. You've noticed we've moved the name cart inside, right? The name cart's inside because somebody felt the name cart outside said, if you're one of us, grab your name tag, and if you're not one of us, well, then this is one marker that shows you that you're different. We don't mean to be exclusionary. We don't mean to say you're different. But sometimes in our best efforts to put our name tags on so people will know who we are, we also send other messages that we don't mean to send. When was the last time we looked at how we could be intentionally inclusive? Thankfully, we do that fairly regularly, don't we? We look at how do we welcome people in. We wonder and we ask and we find ways to, to invite people to be part of God's creation, God's love. When was the last time we asked ourselves, though, if we're excluding somebody because they were different they didn't follow our rules. They didn't speak our language well. All too often, without meaning to, we're guilty of such behavior. And here's our warning that God is giving us. It's the same warning he gave them then, 2,000 years ago. The warning is, it's not about us. It's not about you. 
In his book, A Purpose Driven Life, the first thing that uh, the author says is that it's not about you. And that struck me pretty hard because you know what? At that point, while I wouldn't have said it was about me, I realized I certainly believed it was. I'd ask who here today has struggled with that too, but I don't want to know the answer. You don't want to say it either, right? Everybody's going, please shut up and go on. It's not about us. Those men that stood there today and saw the disciples speaking realized very quickly it wasn't about them. They had made it about them. They were offended. They were ashamed. They were upset. And they ostracized and they tried to dismiss what was going on because it was about them. Number two, you and I are not as important to God's work as we think we are. Don't ever tell a minister that. I don't want to hear it. I devoted my life to serving God. How could I not be as important to God's work? Well, that's really, things go on without me, don't they? If all of a sudden I'm not here, God's work stops. Geneva folds up, the presbytery is done, the denomination's finished. No, not even close. If I'm not here, Geneva lives on, doesn't it? The church work continues. I'm just one little cog in the giant machine that is able to continue. I am not as important to God's work as I sometimes like to think that I am. None of us are. And lastly, clearly God can use and will use whomever God chooses. These men came willing to waiting for the Spirit to move. And when the Spirit came, like a rush of wind and tongues of fire lit up on top of their head, and they came out and they started to preach the good news, everybody heard in their own language. These were not priestly men. These were not religious elites. They were not of the right fi uh, tribe or family. They were not trained, but God still used them to do God's work, and the world changed forevermore because of what they were willing to do and because of the way God used them. There are people here today who say, it's not much I can do. That's not my job. I'm not trained or equipped to do that. I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too this, I'm too that. And God can use whoever God chooses to do the work that we're called to. And that could be you. Now, if you come to me and tell me it's you, I'm going to say, but aren't you a Galatian? I hope not, right? It's not about me. I'm not as important as I think I am. And God will use who God chooses. And what and how do we respond to that? With joy, with glad hearts, with participation. Imagine what the what Israel would look like, if, or what Judah would look like, if, if those people that, that were the religious establishment saw what the disciples were doing and said, yay, praise God. There might have been a little difference in their world at that time. The question is, how do we respond? How do we respond when God wants to use us and we don't feel adequate for the job? How do we respond when others are called and we don't think they're adequate for the job. Do we ever think such a thing? As good Presbyterians, we don't think that way, right? As good Christians, we don't think that, that... At what point do we stop and say, I need to look at myself and say, where am I drawing lines that I shouldn't be drawing? How do I get rid of my own bigotry? Bigotry isn't always about race. Sometimes it's about other things. It's about other preconceived ideas. It's around things that we hold sacred and dear. Where do we let go of our own ideals of self-importance, of group importance, of ideals of who we think we should be? How do we do that? May God work on us this week and continuing on that we might be open to the indwelling of God's Spirit however played out in our lives. May the day of Pentecost not be limited to one event, 
2,000 years ago or one day a year. But may Pentecost happen regularly. Lord knows right now more than ever before in our lifetimes, we need to see more of the Spirit's action in our world. We need to see a revival of people coming to know God. What was the effect the disciples had? 5,000 people that day, I don't know we didn't read it, but 5,000 people that day came to know God. Is that right? Am I, am I getting my numbers right? I think so too. So we have two people who think we're right, so that's good. <laughs> Their actions impacted a lot of people. We today need that more than ever before. It's going to be incumbent upon us to say wow, not how. To say good work, not that's not right. It's going to be incumbent upon us to recognize our own bigotries that keep us held back and hold others back so that the Spirit can work, the world can change, and that we can come back to God in new and powerful ways. It's time. It's time to happen. It's been 80 years since the last time this happened. It's been two full measures. It's time, and we look forward to that. We need to be ready. May God continue to help us develop those skills and that ability and to be so self-aware that the moment we say, aren't they Galatians, that we would stop immediately and say, that's the Holy Spirit. It's not about me, it's about God. And I will support it. Amen? Let us pray. Lord, you have moved throughout history in powerful and mighty ways, using people that we wouldn't think would be used for your purpose. You don't always follow our rules very well, God, but we pray that you would forgive us for thinking you should. We pray that you would help us to see your movement in new and powerful ways, and we pray that your Spirit would come to our world today and create a new church, a new people, raise up a new generation, God, to follow you, and may we be here not only being their cheerleaders, but their support in ministry without holding them back and making them conform to who we think you've called us to be. Help us to see who you've called us to be today, God. Help us to be the new church of Pentecost. Help us, God, to welcome your spirit and to be part of your work, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pentecost, again, is that time once a year where we celebrate God's indwelling spirit, but yet monthly we also recognize that gift that Jesus gives us. The gift of the table where we are called to gather. This was Jesus' invitation to all people to come to allow God to take care of to indwell, to be a part of our lives. This is God's table. It's not my table. It's not Geneva's table. It's not the church's table. The invitation comes from God to all people. It's where we come to find that that veil between this world and the next grows thin. And we can see the hope of what is to come that time when we gather around God's table all together where all of our hungers are satisfied, all of our thirsts are satiated, and we are well-fed and well-cared for. We also look back and we're grateful for that way that Jesus was so obedient to give himself completely and fully so that we might be grafted into that family of God and have that opportunity for an eternity with God. Jesus walked with his disciples for three years, but at Passover, one year, things changed. And he gathered with his disciples for the last time, and as they're eating, Jesus started to indicate things were changing, and he took the bread, he gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, here, take and eat, all of you, this is my body broken for you. You and I understand what he meant those disciples sat there and wondered what was coming, what was happening. This is my body, broken for you. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to God, gave the cup to his disciples and said, here, take and drink 
all of you, this is my blood shed for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, as often as you and I eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Christ's death and rising, looking forward to the day he comes again in great glory when we will be reunited with God for eternity. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, and all are welcome to come and eat. come down to you. Go and serve. Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us take and eat. And this is the blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. Take and drink. How joyful are we who have been called to this table, who have partaken of this food and have been so fed. May God send us out now, having been so fed, to go and serve, to be not only an example to the world, but to be Christ's love and embodiment to a world in need of that more than ever. Amen. As we finish our, our praise and our worship time together, let us stand in body or spirit as we sing our final hymn, The Summons. Yeah. 
you have a prayer, if you'd like to have somebody pray with you, Bonnie will be down front, and you're welcome to come forward to, for prayer. Uh, if you would like, I'll also be coming back in, and I can pray with you too as soon as people leave. I said I didn't want to offend, and that I didn't want people to get agitated with bigotry, but you know, the truth is, we do want the Word of God to challenge us at least a little bit. May we be challenged today, this week. May the Word of God burn in our hearts and in our lives, causing us to be something new. So as we go out to love and serve the Lord, may we also go out feeling the face of God shining upon us, God's love being revealed to us, and may we dwell in God in new ways this week. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>